Hello. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, uh, for that very kind introduction. And it's a great honor to be with you this afternoon. Um, one thing that Jonathan mentioned is that um, not all your speakers will necessarily have been born in the traditions they're speaking to. In my case, I was received into the Roman Catholic Church 22 years ago uh, at the beginning of my graduate studies. And I am the son of a Protestant pastor. My task is to illuminate for you the Roman Catholic view of life and learning. That's what Jonathan told me I had to speak on, which is, when all is said and done, an impossibly large subject. The church's history spans 20 centuries, and its reach extends to virtually every culture on the globe. Catholics number among their saints, illiterate peasant children, married middle-class couples, artists, lawyers, warrior kings, poets, and some of the great minds who have ever lived. Among those great minds, moreover, there is sometimes profound disagreement on what would appear to be quite fundamental matters. The Roman Catholic Church is a very large place, not just in terms of sheer numbers, but also intellectually. Discovering a single view of life and learning amidst the church's diversity is a daunting task. In approaching my theme, I'm also cognizant of the fact that I am addressing an audience at Eastern University, an American institution of higher learning with a Baptist foundation. The United States of America is culturally very much a Protestant country. Indeed, it may be the most deeply Protestant country in the world. We therefore inherit and on occasion rehearse the polemics of the 16th century. And this colors our understanding of the meaning of Roman Catholicism. At the very least, the church tends to be seen by many Americans as something exotic or foreign to our experience. It may perhaps be something to learn about if you're an anthropologist, say, but it is not something to learn from. To illustrate what I believe is an enduring American attitude towards Catholicism, I'd like to relate to you a letter of John Adams to his wife, Abigail. During the First Continental Congress in 1774, while on a Sunday stroll with George Washington, Adams happened to step inside Old St. Mary's Catholic Church in Philadelphia during Mass. Here is how he described the experience. This afternoon's entertainment was to me most awful and affecting. The poor wretches fingering their beads, chanting Latin, not a word of which they understood. Their paternosters and Ave Marias, their holy water, the crossings themselves perpetually, their bowing at the name of Jesus whenever they hear it, their genuflections before the altar. The dress of the priest was rich with lace. His pulpit was velvet and gold. The altarpiece was very rich, little images and crucifixes about, about, and wax candles lighted up. But how shall I describe the picture of our Savior in a frame of marble over the altar? In, um, at full length, upon the cross, in his agonies, and the blood dripping and streaming from his wounds. The music consisting of an organ and a choir of singers went all the afternoon except sermon time, and the assembly chanted most sweetly and exquisitely. Here is everything which can lay hold of the eye, ear, and imagination, everything which can charm and bewitch the simple and the ignorant. I wonder how Luther ever broke the spell. So John Adams. A spell, bewitchment. The imagination of the simple and the ignorant laid hold upon, enslaved by hocus pocus. Here is one interpretation of the Catholic view of life and learning, implying on the one hand an obscurantist system of encrusted man-made ritual that bypasses human reason altogether, and on the other, a narrow and incredible dogmatism to which the faithful can subscribe only at the cost of the mutilation of both their freedom and their intellects. Now I raise this unpleasantness not so as to grossly violate the canons of ecumenical dialogue, but rather to observe how far this well-known style of polemic is from the older and more serious Reformation objection to the Roman Catholic view of life and learning. The older objection is this, that in Catholicism, the Christian gospel has been made captive and subordinated to pagan philosophy, where the word of God should be that on which Christians stand 
and indeed stand alone. Instead, in the Catholic tradition, there appear to be other foundations for the Christian life, sacred tradition for one thing, but also philosophy, the indispensable handmaiden of theology. In effect, the reformers con uh, contended, the Catholic faith is too philosophical, too rational, leaving not enough room either for faith or for grace. Sancta Socrates ora pro nobis, wrote Erasmus of Rotterdam. Saint Socrates, pray for us. That was the kind of lively and ironical remark of the Catholic humanist tradition, which inflamed the magisterial reformers, and their task as they saw it was to liberate the gospel from the erring hubris of human wisdom. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? <laughs>